This is a quick summary of the various schools of thought in economic development. First, there is Walt Rostow's linear stages of growth model. Rostow looked historically at how countries grew, and he said all countries develop via the following stages. A traditional stage, then there are preconditions for takeoff into self-sustaining growth. Stage number three is the takeoff stage. Stage four is the drive to maturity. And stage five is the age of mass consumption. The criticism of Rostow's theory as it applies to economic development is that we've seen the patterns of specialization and trade making this theory less applicable to developing countries today. They don't have to go through these five stages. You can actually find a faster route to growth via specialization and international trade. The next theory is the Haradomar model. It assumes fixed input output ratios embodied in technologies. And the Haradomar model concludes that developing countries must increase their savings rates in order that they can increase their capital stock and therefore increase their capital labor ratios. And this will cause an increase in economic growth. Or they must reduce their capital output ratios and use more labor intensive processes. Countries must figure out, do I want to use a more labor intensive process to develop or do I want a more capital intensive process? But they must figure this out and then move in that particular direction. The assumption is that the technological change must occur. And often you can just adopt another technology from another country. The main criticism of the Haradomar model is that an increased savings rate is not enough. Other important resources are scarce, managerial competence, for example, skilled labor, and administrative talent. In other words, the Howard Domar idea of focusing on labor and capital is shown to be deficient because there are other key resources that are needed. You can bring the labor and capital together, but if you don't have the managerial competence, you don't have the skilled labor, you don't have the administrators to make it work, then the resources by themselves will not create the results you want. And then there is the two-sector model due to Sir Arthur Lewis, the structural change model. This model assumes that developing countries are faced with a rural subsistence sector characterized by zero marginal product of labor. That means the production function has maxed out, so additional workers do not contribute anything to output. And it pays workers a fixed average subsistence wage. The second key assumption is an urban modern sector which is characterized by a positive marginal product of labor, paying a wage higher than the subsistence wage. Expansion of the modern sector will then draw surplus labor from the rural area at a rate determined by the rate of capital accumulation, i.e. the rate of profitability in the modern sector. Because the modern sector is using capitalist principles and paying at the margin, there is a possibility it will accumulate profits, and these profits reinvested into the operation will become the engine for capital accumulation and economic development. Accumulated profits are reinvested in the urban area, and this draws more labor from the rural area until all the surplus labor is absorbed. Thereafter, additional workers can be had from the rural sector only with some decline in rural output. This is an interesting idea, because if you've drawn off all the surplus, and you're going to reduce the amount of food being produced for an increasingly urban population, then you would be forced to consider imports. The Alternative is that prices would have to rise so that workers can be drawn back to the rural area or new technologies would have to be used to enhance agricultural productivity. The main criticisms of the Lewis model. The assumption that the urban sector will create jobs at a rate proportional to its rate of capital accumulation does not take into consideration the possibility of the urban sector investing in a labor-saving technology thereby leaving the underemployed out of the equation. The second criticism is that the notion that it is the rural sector rather than the urban sector which has underemployed labor might not conform to the reality in many less developed countries. And these criticisms are by other researchers who disagree with what Lewis may have said. The notion of a competitive urban labor market yielding a fixed wage might not conform to reality in most developing countries where urban wages rise even when there is urban unemployment. 